From the skies over Germany, where B-17s relentlessly bombed the Nazi war machine. To high above the desert of Iraq, where fighter bombers use laser-guided weapons against Saddam Hussein. High-tech air power has become so prominent that experts now wonder, can bombing win a war? On January 17, 1991, nearly 700 aircraft prepared to attack Iraq and Kuwait. This was the beginning of Operation Desert Storm, six months after Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. It would be a war unlike any other, a war of high technology, fought mostly in the air, and bearing an eerie resemblance to a video game. Laser coming on. Got the laser on. Holding the track and steady on the far corner. Roger. Take call sign. Call it that. Good. 10 seconds. Shell 4-1. I've got a tell you. I think that's wedged to the south. 4, 3, 2, I'm out of my position one. for about 10 miles. Should be impact. Boom! Oh, yes! Coming right. Both the Gulf War and the latest airstrikes in Iraq have demonstrated our new reliance on high-tech bombing. The Iraqis were especially stunned by the attacks two years ago, and so was the rest of the world, watching the briefings at home. These first two will be F-111 deliveries using laser-guided bombs. This is a runway at an airfield halfway between uh, Baghdad and Kuwait. The center of the runway is the end point. This is where the uh, laser designator is pointed. This is taken at night with infrared sensors, and there the bomb goes off in the center of the runway. In the Gulf War, the main coalition strategy was to use precision bombing to cripple Iraq's ability to fight before the ground offensive began. The primary target of the first airstrikes was the Iraqi capital. Not everybody's familiar with Baghdad, but most people are familiar with Washington. Imagine, if you will, the Pentagon being hit, Congress being hit, the White House being hit, the AT&T building being hit, and then you wake up to all this noise and you reach over to turn on your lights, the lights don't come on uh, because we've hit all the power plants surrounding the Washington area. You pick up the telephone and the telephone's dead. You can't talk to anybody. That's in effect what we were able to do and what we targeted in downtown Baghdad. What used to take months to accomplish in previous wars now took hours. Gulf 3 is 13 to 21, 5, getting normal. Long before the ground offensive began, the air campaign was destroying Iraq's ability to attack or even defend itself. What we were really are trying to do in many ways was to take away Saddam Hussein's ability to see. So by, in that way, we took away the, the radar, which was the most important sight available to him. We took away his ability to hear from the standpoint of having communications coming into him from, from a variety of sources to tell him what was going on. And we took away his communications, his outbound communications, so that he could not tell his forces what to do in any sort of a coherent way. To carry out the coalition strategy, F-111 fighter bombers used laser-guided bombs to knock out targets deep in Iraqi territory. The F-117 Nighthawk, better known as Stealth, bombed Baghdad at will without ever being picked up by enemy radar. Satellites traveling thousands of miles overhead identified the smallest Iraqi targets down to a single jeep. Planes crammed with sophisticated radar systems continually tracked enemy aircraft. Exhilarated by the success of the high-tech air war, some in the military called it a revolution. 
It's revolutionary from the sense of the very few number of bombs that were required in order to achieve a, an enormous amount of very, very focused, precise destruction. It is revolutionary in that it was the first war in which single airplanes were able to fly through to their targets and accomplish what in the past either could not have been accomplished at all or would have taken literally thousands of airplanes to accomplish. Have we entered a new era in which bombing alone can win a war? If so, modern technology may have finally caught up with nearly a century of theory with profound implications for the future of warfare. Hold on, Pyrex ground, uh, Emerald T6. Copy. This is where the history of bombing really begins. Not in the air, but on the ground in a war mired in the mud. Out of the bloody stalemate of World War I was born a new theory of air power. Eleven years after the Wright brothers' first flight, the armies of the First World War battered each other from trenches spread over hundreds of miles. It was a kind of mass suicide, each army unable to outflank the other, locked in a deadly embrace. A visitor to the front would have been hard pressed to find evidence of the revolution in aviation that already had begun. Of the one million casualties the Allies suffered in the first three months of the war, virtually none were inflicted from the air. But that was about to change. Germans believe that bombs over London will weaken the will of a populace. A giant Zeppelin leaves its base for a night raid. London is in darkness. Searchlights scan the air. Signals scream out their warnings. Take cover. Newsreels testified later to the great psychological effect of the first Zeppelin raids in 1915. But the airships were filled with inflammable gas and made easy targets. It wasn't long before the airplane became the bomber of choice. Airplanes were faster, more maneuverable, and harder to hit from the ground. From a high-flying plane, the whole world seemed a target. Railroads, lines of communications, factories, every street and every house, civilians as well as soldiers. Military theorists distinguished between two kinds of bombing, strategic bombing and tactical bombing. Tactical bombing was used at the front in direct support of ground operations. But strategic bombing was carried out far from the battle lines, often deep in enemy territory. Its object was to cripple the enemy's ability to wage war by destroying both its resources and its will to fight. An early proponent of strategic bombing, Giulio Due of Italy, wrote that if long-range bombing could create intolerable conditions on the home front, the enemy must admit defeat, no matter what the status of its ground forces. Douay's critics called it the Douay theory of frightfulness. In the early part of the First World War, the planes themselves seemed unequal to the task. They could carry only a few small bombs and had limited range. But improvements in technology came rapidly under the pressure of war. This German bomber had more powerful engines than its predecessors and could carry up to a thousand pounds of bombs. In the spring of 1917, it was put to the test. Its destination was London. It was a beautiful day, a beautiful June day. 
And uh, suddenly in the sky there appeared this formation. And they looked up and saw these things and some said, what a beautiful sight this was. The target was Liverpool Street Station and these bombs started to drop. Nearly 600 